Let's say we have a one dimensional signal or a time series data expressed in a form of a vector. I have labeled this vector as I. We can also see it as a one dimensional image. By the way, all that I will explain today using one dimensional vectors will also apply to two dimensional images. And we desire to smooth this one dimensional image or a vector. To smooth here means that we want to suppress the intensity variations between the neighboring entries. Or if we are dealing with images, we will say that we want to suppress the variations between neighboring pixels. And this so-called smoothing is typically done by taking the local average around each pixel. As an example, let's try to average around the fourth entry, the place where you see the arrow. And we will put the result of that averaging in another vector that I have labeled as J. To do this averaging, we will only take two neighbors into consideration, one from left and one from right. You could take more neighbors to do the averaging. The selection of two neighbors here in my example is just, it's just an example. And for this case, the result will be four. Let's do it one more time for another entry in the vector. But what if we want to take this averaging for the first entry? You see, it only has one neighbor. The other neighbor is missing, the one on the left. The remedy for this problem is to imagine the presence of that missing neighbor. For example, we could say that the missing neighbor most likely is same as that of current entry. And we then say that we have padded our vector or our one dimensional image using the same method. This may sound little strange the first time you hear it. So is this the only way to pat? No, not really. There are two more ways you can pat as such. The second way is to use the value from the other end of the vector. Note that the last entry is six and now we are using that as the missing neighbor. And we say that we have padded with circular. The justification given behind this padding scheme is that maybe the signal is a periodic signal or it repeats itself. And the third way is to simply pad with zero. Let's go with this last padding scheme and compute the average. Simple stuff so far, but now we would redo this operation in a different manner. Here is how we were averaging it so far. Now I could rewrite this expression as following. I hope you would not have any objection or for that matter, even like this. Now this new formulation is quite interesting. A way to see it is that you are scaling the selected entries or pixels in the image by one third and then adding the entries in the resulting vector. We now create a vector of the same size as our selected portion. That is the size of three here and move these scaling values into this new vector and put back the values which were supposed to be scaled back into the vector i. Now we can represent our earlier averaging method as a two part operation. The first operation would be the vector multiplication and the second operation would be to add the entries of the resulting vector. And now we can move this little machine of ours like this. We will stop at the second last entry as we are not doing any padding in this example. And here I have slid it to the remaining entries. We now give this new vector that our sliding machine is using a formal name. We call it filter and hence I have labeled it as F. In this case, it is an averaging filter because, well, it did averaging. So we have our little machine, but it would be good to write it formally as well. Something like this. Formally here means a mathematical operation that is happening in a generalizable form. Essentially, we are specifying that we are multiplying two vectors i and f from minus n to n and then summing the entries. It is important to note that the vector f that is our filter has zeros except only in three places. This is what the second part of the equation is implying. Or rather, we should say that we are putting this constraint on our mathematical formulation. Note this symbol, this little circle. 
between F and I. This is a symbol used for an operation in signal processing called cross correlation. So our machine when mathematically formulated looks like the cross correlation operator from signal processing. And hence we also say that our averaging filter is a correlation filter. By the way, I may interchangeably say cross correlation and correlation. When two vectors are involved like this, correlation implies cross correlation and vice versa. And finally also note this X in there. It specifies a location in the image I where our filter is centered, the place where we generally were putting our arrow. But uh, this simple averaging can be made more interesting. Uh, maybe, maybe we want our selected entry, that is the entry uh, which has the value 3, to have the more contribution towards the average than the neighbors. So another averaging filter could be like this. It is still averaging, but the contribution towards the averages are not the same. And it is the result. And here we move our machine again. So what else our little machine can do? Ah, as such, it can do a lot of things. For example, you can use variety of predefined filters to enhance or reduce the brightness, contrast, saturation, gamma correction, and many more things on images. You can do blurring and whatnot. Heck, you can even take the derivative of an image. Let me show you at least that. Here is another one dimensional image. You should be able to figure out the function for this image just by eyeballing it. It's x square. After uh, recalling very basic knowledge of differentiation, you know that the derivative is going to be simply 2 times x. So we now know what to expect as the output of our correlation machine and the filter. But to be clear, for discrete stuff, derivatives are not really defined like this. Uh, but just go with me on this now for the sake of the example. Let's create our output image J and the placeholder for the filter that will do the magical differentiation. And the entries of the filter will look like this, minus half, zero and half. We now run our correlation machine to see the outputs, that is the entries in J. And indeed J represents the function two times X, which is what we expected. You see this filter stuff and more specifically this little correlation machine of ours is quite powerful. So how do we create or find the, the values of these filters? Well, many scientists and engineers in signal and image processing have come up with these filters. They have invented them. Quite often the filters are even named after them. But I'm glad you asked this question because in modern times the neural networks learn the values of these filters and we will talk about that soon. What else your little machine can do? This guy is never going to be satisfied. Can this machine find the objects in the images? Now that is an interesting question. And yes it can. Let's talk about using correlation to do matching vectors in the next tutorial. By the way, this tutorial is based on the lecture notes by Professor David Jacobs and uh, you will find the link to his notes in the description. And more importantly, if you find this tutorial uh, useful or helpful, it is because of his notes. I'm just a medium who transformed his notes into this, uh, this video. That's all. Really, the credit goes to him. So until then, uh, goodbye and thanks for your time. See you soon. Bye bye.